Our lodge was named after Johannes Kelpius, a mystic, musician and writer of the 17th century. He was born Johann Kelp in 1667 in Transylvania, a province in Romania. After the death of his father in 1684, Johann was sent to complete his education at the University of Altdorf near Nuremberg, Germany, where his name was Latinized to Johannes Kelpius, according to the custom of the scholars of his days. By the age of 22, Kelpius graduated with degrees in liberal arts and philosophy. While at university, he wrote a treaty on the ethics of Aristotle and had published several books on religious subjects. It is thought that while at university, he became acquainted with the pious religious movement. Pietism was initially a reaction against the formalism of orthodox Lutherianism, but spread to include a wide range of esoteric Christian philosophies. One of the most charismatic figures in German pietism was Johann Jacob Zimmermann, a brilliant mathematician, astronomer and cleric. Zimmermann, a former minister, had formed a small group named the Chapter of Perfection. This group was composed mostly of young men like Kelpius. Among the beliefs of this group was a conviction that a new spiritual age was dawning and that it was necessary to prepare for its arrival. They had been invited by William Penn to settle on his land in the New World. In August of 1693, soon before the group was about to depart for America from Rotterdam, Holland, Zimmermann died, leaving the young Kelpius as the group's spiritual leader. Kelpius was determined to complete Zimmermann's mission. They chartered a boat, the Sarah Maria, disembarked at Bohemian Landing, Maryland, and proceeded to Philadelphia and Germantown in June 1694. They established a community along the banks of the Wissahickon River, which is now located in the southern part of the state of Pennsylvania, in what is now called Philadelphia's Fairmount Park. They established a community dedicated to the study, meditation, and the betterment of mankind. There was a natural cave, 16 by 9 feet, in the middle of the nearby hillside, which was dug out further and used by Johannes Kelpius for a study. Johannes Kelpius eventually became ill with tuberculosis, and his health declined until he died in 1708 at the age of 41. The travel diary of Kelpius has been preserved. His literary legacy includes a collection of original hymns, a journal which contains many of his correspondences, and a book on prayer and meditation. Later, Conrad Bissell came to America, and in 1720 he organized the Rosicrucians in the Ephrata, Pennsylvania, located about 38 miles south of Harrisburg. Conrad continued the work for the first cycle of our order in the United States. When AMORC was being organized for the second cycle in the early part of the 20th century, the first plan was to establish a Grand Lodge in each state of the Union. So, by the year 1917, Ten of these Grand Lodges had been chartered. In the summer of 1917, a convention was held in the Moose Temple in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with delegates from all lodges. On this occasion, Mrs. Marie Louise Clemens was initiated into Amorg and was chosen by Imperator H. Spencer Lewis to be the Grand Master of the Massachusetts Grand Lodge, Amorg. Marie Louise Clemens 
was born in 1863 of French ancestry in St. George, Vermont. She had only one year of high school, but she read and studied all her life. Before she became a Rosicrucian, she was active in the Theosophical Society in Boston. The first permanent home for the Massachusetts Grand Lodge was at 739 Boylston Street, Boston, where Mrs. Clemens leased three rooms. Two rooms were used for the temple, while the third, called the Rose Room, was used by Mrs. Clemens for interviews. On December 27, 1917, the first convocation was held at the lodge with 42 members. Mrs. Clemens received lessons which she studied first and then taught her students. She taught classes on Sunday afternoons and Thursday evenings. Convocations were held on one Thursday evening each month. On Sunday evenings, she held public meetings. In 1921, Mrs. Clemens started the Athena Library, renting two more rooms across the hall from the temple. But this library was conducted independently of the lodge. By 1929, the lodge had 95 members. In 1931, the National Grand Lodge was established and regional grand lodges were no longer chartered. Changes were made in the 1931 Constitution whereby regional jurisdictions no longer existed and nine grand councillors were appointed. Lodges now had the status of subordinate lodges of the National Grand Lodge. All members were now members of the National Grand Lodge, and this became a prerequisite to having membership in any of the subordinate bodies. It was not until 1933 that Amwork sent the new constitution to the Massachusetts Grand Lodge to be voted on by the lodge members. A new charter was issued in the name of the Marie L. Clemens Lodge, Amwork. The position of master was made an elective office with a term of one year. Mrs. Clemens conducted all initiations and convocations. Lodge members still did not receive monographs for personal use. On September 22, 1934, Imperator H. Spencer Lewis came to Boston and made an address in the temple where 52 active members and four honorary members of the lodge attended. Mrs. Clemens left the lodge in 1940. She passed through transition on October 19, 1956. At a meeting in early May 1940, the Lodge members decided to name the Lodge Boston Lodge. But the Imperator asked that a different name be chosen, as he wished to have former Rosicrucians commemorated in the naming of local lodges. By the end of May, the name Johannes Kelpius Lodge was selected by the Lodge members. So our lodge was founded with the title of 
Massachusetts Grand Lodge in 1917 and continued with this name for 16 years until 1933 when it became the Marie L. Clemens Lodge for seven years. In 1940, our present name, Johannes Kelpius Lodge, was chosen and continues to this day. In 1942, a morgue gradually changed all Grand Lodges into minor lodges. Grand Lodge members did not receive any monographs, but were required to attend classes at the Lodge and hear the monographs read by the Master. Notes could be taken, but the monographs were kept at the Lodge. If a member missed a lesson, he or she could read it under supervision at a later time. Members who lived some distance from a lodge received their monographs in the mail. They were called national members. In October 1944, the Johannes Kelpius Lodge sent a petition to the Supreme Secretary to become a minor lodge. The advantage of being a minor lodge allowed its members to receive monographs. On February the 3rd, 1945, the second Imperator, Frater Ralph M. Lewis, visited the Lodge and gave a lecture on the Seven Steps to Attainment. A total of 191 Rosicrucians attended this event. After the Imperator's visit in February, the Lodge achieved the status of Minor Lodge. The first Minor Lodge initiation was held on March 11, 1945 and the first convocation of the Minor Lodge was held a week later, on March 18th. The title Minor Lodge was discontinued in 1946 and became subordinate bodies. Several years later, this term was changed to affiliated bodies. The Boston chapter of the Junior Order of the Torchbearers was started in the fall of 1945 for children between the ages of 6 and 18 years old. Children of non-members were also welcome. Meetings were held on a Saturday afternoon. Sora's Evelyn B. Lyle and Clara A. Bromley, both of whom later became masters, compiled a songbook for use in convocations, and this book was first used on the 23rd of June, 1946. Chantress Marilyn Barrow led the singing music was enjoyed by all. In August 1946, the Lodge enjoyed a corn boil at the Wentworth Farms and this event became an annual tradition until 1971 when the Wentworths were no longer able to serve as hosts. However, this picnic has continued to be a favourite with all members and has been held at the homes of Lodge members who have spacious backyards or in the backyard of the Lodge here at 13 Clevemont Avenue until the 1990s. That same year there was a fire on the floor beneath the temple. Thankfully there was only smoke damage. After that experience, the Lodge purchased fire insurance. On the 1st of September 1946, the landlord raised the rent to $125 per month. And this increase created a serious financial burden on the Lodge. The following March, the building was sold and the new owner raised the rent to $346 per month. The new owner also decided to reduce the elevator service and close the building on Sundays and holidays. During the spring and summer of 1947, the master searched for a new site and purchased a house at 284 Marlborough Street, just four blocks from the Boyston Street location. Evelyn B. Lyle, MD, Master of the Lodge, and Frater Milton Guberman, 
both financed the house and established a trust which handled all legal aspects. The lodge had rooms on the first floor and basement which included the temple, master's study, library and kitchen. There was also an outdoor garden area. Dr Lyle occupied a few rooms on the second floor and the other two rooms above her apartment were rented out to tenants. This arrangement was necessary in order to receive income to pay the mortgage on the house. At the end of August 1947, the lodge moved to 284 Marlborough Street and held its first convocation at that location on the first Sunday in September. The new lodge had a kitchen which allowed the members to enjoy a social hour with refreshments after convocations to discuss Rosicrucian principles in privacy instead of going to a restaurant which had been the custom for many years. In the past, the lodge members had been accustomed to meeting in a building which was empty of tenants during the evenings and Sundays. At this new location, the other tenants might be in their upstairs rooms while meetings were held. Members had to share the front hall with the tenants and sometimes the kitchen was not always available and the rent of $130 per month was still a financial burden. So once again, in the early part of 1950, the lodge members started to look for a new place. It wasn't until 1951 that a new location was found. The lodge moved to room 239 of the old Hotel Brunswick at 520 Boylston Street on the corner of Boylston and Clarendon. During World War II, this hotel was occupied by the Coast Guard. The rent of $60 per month was more manageable. On January 28, 1951, the first convocation was held in temporary quarters at the hotel until the new temple in Suite 239 was dedicated on March 4, 1951. Two sorors, June Day and Eugenia Perry, who were trained artists, decorated the temple with the main part consisting of three panels in Egyptian style to represent Nefertiti and Akhenaten. These three panels are still in our temple today. While the lodge met at the Hotel Brunswick, no kinsher ones available. So once again, the lodge members went to restaurants for refreshments. On June 1, 1951, the main convocations were moved to Friday nights. On April 9, 1952, the bylaws were amended to move them back to Sunday evenings. In 1962, they were moved back to Friday evenings where they remain to this day. On Sunday, May 10, 1953, the Johannes Kelpius Lodge celebrated Providence Night. On this night, the lodge hosted members of the Roger Williams chapter over at Island. This was the first official meeting of the two groups. Later that year, on July 26, members of the Johannes Kelpis and Roger Williams enjoyed a trip to the Cathedral of the Pines in Ringe, New Hampshire. On October 26, 1954, the Imperator Frater Ralph M. Lewis visited the Lodge for the second time. On October 1956, the Lodge's pleasant venue at the Hotel Brunswick was sold and the hotel closed its doors on January 18, 1957. The 83-year-old building was torn down and replaced with an IBM building. Once again, it was necessary to seek a new location. In early 1957, the lodge moved to the third floor of the Gainsborough building at 295 Huntington Avenue, opposite the New England Conservatory of Music. The move was completed during the coldest and snowiest January week since 1883. There were various offices in the building, with a cafeteria and a drugstore on the ground floor. The lodge continued its various activities, with another trip to the Cathedral of Pines, New Year's watch night services, a Pops concert evening, and the annual corn boil at the Wentworth Farm in Peabody. The 1960s were full of social activities, such as the monthly lodge suppers for $1.25 per person, the annual clam bake, a Halloween party, and square dancing at the lodge. 
On October 1963, the Johannes Kepius Lodge abolished specific monthly membership dues and adopted the concept of AMRA or donations. On October 1965, the members started searching for a new lodge location. In late August 1966, the lodge moved to our current location at 13 Clevemont Avenue in Alston. The first convocation in the new building was held on September 2, 1966. For over a year, the building was rented by the lodge, but in December 1967, the lodge was purchased and became our own permanent home. Members were happy to have a kitchen, social room, library, master's office, temple, and a large storage area in the cellar. They also enjoyed a backyard that was useful for outdoor receptions and picnics. On Sunday, July 30th, 1967, the lodge celebrated its 50th anniversary when a special ritual drama was presented by the members. Two paintings by Father Paul Murphy were added to the temple. Both pictures depicted basic scientific Ozukushan principles. One is of a magnet showing the interrelationship of north and south and the vibratory flow between them. The other painting, still in the temple today, shows the formation of matter through electrons, molecules and atoms. The large oil painting depicting a blue robe figure casting the shadow of a cross was painted and donated to the large by Sir Eleanor Ryan in the spring of 1946. In the winter of 1972, to cut costs, the bulletin mailing list was reduced to only lodge members and those within 25 miles of Boston. You could request a copy if you donated one year's postage, which amounted to 50 cents. Over the years, the bulletin has taken many forms, expressing the creativity of the members. It is now sent by email. In August 1981, on a trip to the Cathedral of the Pines in New Hampshire, Members of the Johannes Kelpius Lodge noticed that a mork was not represented among the fraternal and civic plaques on the pulpit. They presented their vision to the then Imperator Ralph M. Lewis and on Saturday the 30th of August 1986 an Amork plaque was dedicated in a ceremony with a theme of world peace. Attending that ceremony were Rosicrucians from all over New England and during the ceremony they sang Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Since then, almost every year, Rosicrucians have travelled to the Cathedral of the Pines for a ceremony rededicating the plot.
the late 70s and 80s, the Lodge had a traveling initiation team who used a van to visit nearby affiliated bodies and provide temple degree initiations. Another activity which the Lodge sponsored from its early days was the Sunshine Circle. This group existed as an autonomous body and was open to both Rosicrucians and non-members. This group collected clothing for Morgan Memorial, gave turkeys and toys to needy families and orphanages, and gave charity and help to various agencies. They raised money through yard sales and raffles and had their own treasury. In 1963, the Sunshine Circle was replaced by the Rosicrucian Sunshine Committee, which functioned under the direction of the Master to help with advice and metaphysical aid for ailments. This committee evolved into our present healing committee. Reunion Day was a popular activity in New England, when affiliated bodies would host in turn a one-day activity at their location. RCUI weekends have been particularly popular over the last few years, with visiting speakers in the spring and in the fall. At our 90th anniversary in 2007, we were honored by the presence of our Grand Master Julie Scott and celebrated the existence of this beautiful lodge in New England. On this occasion, a time capsule was buried in the backyard to be opened 90 years later after October 21st, 2097. Over the years, various activities have taken place and each master brings their own flavor to their year of service. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue. Clouds of white, the bright blessed day, the dark sacred night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky. Also on the faces of people going by, I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They learn much more. I never knew And I think to myself What a wonderful world Yes, I think to myself What a wonderful world The word cologne means dove, which is an esoteric mystical symbol of the Rosicrucian order. A cologne symbolizes the purity of light, truth and conscience. Her pure white vestments, as she serves in the temple, are reminders of virtue, love and limitless understanding. 
in recent years to assist the Colomes with their beautiful journey to greater understanding and light, the Johannes Kelpius Lodge has created a Cologne Fund. The fund has been established so that our beloved Colomes may have the opportunity to travel on occasion and take part in the various Rosicrucian conventions that are held throughout the country. The funds may also be used to assist them in other ways deemed helpful to a particular need at a particular time. For the past few years, the Johannes Kelpius Lodge has been organising an annual Cologne fundraise dinner. Our beautiful and devoted Colomes prepare an entire dinner buffet. The preparation of the dinner is a practice and concentration for each Cologne. For each works quietly and at the same time keep their mind focused on thoughts of peace, love, compassion and community, all the while infusing the food to be served with the beautiful vibrations of their loving thoughts. Martinism has had a presence in Boston for many years. The Imperator authorized the formation of a heptad of the traditional Martinist order at the Lodge in 1943. After a while, its activities went dormant. In 1981, the Lodge reopened its doors to the traditional Martinist order, and activities continue to this day. Each year, the day after the New Year ceremony and installation of officers in March, the members and their guests celebrate at the annual dinner dance. This is always a popular activity.
Fathers and sorors, welcome to our 100th anniversary convention. On behalf of our convention committee, the Johannes Kelpius Lodge, and all the Wozukushan members in the New England area, I would like to thank you for joining us to celebrate this mystical milestone.